Um, we are welcoming today uh, someone that a lot of people in Macedonia already have seen or heard in some capacity already, Professor Sam Vaknin. It's our pleasure to welcome you to our uh, podcast. Um, Thank you for having me. I don't think you need much of an introduction, but please go ahead and give us like yeah. the short let's introduction. Not, let's not waste time on me. I, I'm a professor of clinical psychology in several universities in Cambridge, United Kingdom. I just became visiting professor in Southeastern uh, European University in uh, Skopje and Tetovo. And uh, I used to be visiting professor of psychology in um, South Federal University, Southern Federal University in Russia in uh, mm -hmm. Don until the war started and they kicked out all the foreigners. So I've been a professor all around and I'm the author of dozens of books on personality disorders, economics, philosophy, etc. Et I don't have what, much to do in life, so mm -hmm. I just write things and make videos. I have a YouTube channel with uh, channels, a few, with half a million subscribers. The channels deal with narcissism, with politics, with economics, with philosophy and so on and so forth. So, Again, there's a, a wide range. I write short fiction. I write poetry. Let's call it the end of the introduction. <laughs> and okay, get, okay. get to business. Yeah. It was a pretty good introduction, I have to say. Yeah. So uh, people have heard you talk about uh, various different subjects. Uh, economics, um, politics, uh, international uh, politics, and also domestic politics in Macedonia from the time when you were an advisor to the government of Macedonia, if I'm not mistaken. So one thing that I haven't heard, heard, heard about, and I'm sure people will be wondering is, how did you get, uh, end up in an advisory role on the uh, government of Macedonia? This was some years uh, prior. If you could I go must, through the history of, 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 of I that. I must warn you that I've been outside Macedonia for more than seven years, almost eight years. I lived mm. in Russia, then I lived in Hungary. Mm and then in the United Kingdom. So I am not up to date with Macedonian affairs and so on, and we would be wasting time if you were to ask me about Macedonian affairs. I, I don't know much. I, mm. I returned to Macedonia because I needed to be with my wife for some medical condition, but mm. um, so. Historically, what happened is I had a friend here, an Israeli friend, I'm an Israeli. I had an Israeli friend who was living in Skopje and I have worked with him in Serbia. I was advisor to many entities in Serbia, to the mm -hmm. city of Belgrade, to some banks in Serbia, and so on and so forth, to the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And he was an Israeli, I'm an Israeli, and so we teamed up in, in Serbia, mostly socially. Mm -hmm. And then when he came to Macedonia, he left Serbia, he, he came to Macedonia, he has a good nose for opportunities. Macedonia was much more of an opportunity than Serbia after the Kosovo crisis. So he came to, to Macedonia and he told me, listen, this is a new country that's, that's like Israel when it started. They are very, they're very nice people, they're kind people, empathic and warm, but they don't know they don't know much about anything. <laughs> they don't know how to do things. They Especially how the world works. <laughs> yes, they don't know about capitalism. They don't know about mm. stock exchange. They don't know how to privatize companies. They, they, they're completely lost. They're clueless and lost. And as opposed to big countries like Russia, where all the eminent academics went, for example, Zaks and, and so on, no one wanted to come to Macedonia. It's too small. And there wasn't mm. enough money here. So Macedonia was really begging. I remember that it was begging. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the United Kingdom, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Israel for help. <clears throat> and no one wanted to help. There was USAID, there was FSVC, and, but no one essentially gave any serious help. Mm -hmm. So I relocated here. I moved, I moved here. And I was Where did you live? I lived in Israel. I moved from Israel here. No, I mean, where did you live in Macedonia where, when you relocated? Uh, Skopje, immediately. Yeah, Skopje. I, came, okay. I came to Skopje. And I became advisor, uh, I became advisor to the agency of privatization and advisor to the stock exchange. Uh, essentially, I helped to build the stock exchange. And then various ministers, like the Minister of Finance and so on, <clears throat> asked for my help. And then I got involved with the VMRO. <laughs> and the VMRO got into power. And I had a, a student and I singled him out and I told him, you're going to be very famous. 
and one day you're going to be prime minister of Macedonia. And he found it very, very funny because at that time he was a broker in some very small bank. His name was Nikola Guerski. <laughs> we wrote a book together. We published dialogues in, at that time, Nevnik and other mm. newspapers. We wrote a book together and published it. And when he became minister of, at the time, minister of trade, he mm. invited me over back. I was living at that time in Czech Republic and Moscow. He invited me back. And that's how it started. I became advisor to the government and so on and so forth. That's, so are, that's you, mm, are you still on might. friendly terms with, uh, with the old prime minister? Yes. <laughs> with Nikola yes. Ruski, yeah? Uh, do, Nikola you, do you speak? Is, Nikola is among my best friends, absolutely. Awesome. How would they, how is he taking what is no, happening? I, I never gossip about my best friends. <laughs> okay, okay. That's why <laughs> we, they remain we, my best friends. <laughs> but may, maybe we can use your influence with him to get him on this podcast. He's been, I don't know, successfully avoiding us so far. Although we have been some of his staunchest supporters, his economic policies, his, uh, you know, his um, basically leadership through the international monetary crisis and and all the rest of the stuff. That's why <coughs> that I was his best. Um, I apologize for all these respiratory special effects. <coughs> I can't help it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to talk. Uh, that I was his special friend did not mean that I was not one of his strongest critics. Mm. When he was in government, I was one of his strongest critics mm. uh, as a prime minister. And um, I disagreed with some of his policies, and I disagreed with his inability to control the corruption in the, mm. in the government. But we still remain very good friends, and I still think that Nikola Guevski revolutionized Macedonia and has created single-handedly the modern Macedonia. The Macedonia we live in, everything from buildings to mentality has been shaped by Nikola Guevski. You, you will find no argument from us to that. I mean, we, yeah. we, keep, we, we say on this podcast that objectively Nikola Gruevski has been the best prime minister of Macedonia. The greatest prime minister in, in history. Absolutely. I work with all of them. I work with Sovenkovsky. He's the greatest ever in, mm. uh, in Macedonia. I have uh, one objection. He con if I might interrupt, I have one objection. Yeah. Gruevski continued to negotiate about our name. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's a mistake. He should have dropped the negotiations as soon as he came into power. He has no right to talk about my name and my grandfather's name and Macedonian name overall. So yeah, well, I don't think he had much. Well, unforgivable. I don't, think he, had, uh, much I don't think he had much choice. I don't think he had much choice. He, he, he was we had he, we had a, the we had Hague uh, International Court of Justice gave us a verdict mm -hmm. in our, uh, you know. Used this was a good uh, lesson of the value of the of any judgment of the international court in Hague. Yes. I think for Macedonians, yeah. Yeah. I know they cannot I don't implement. Think, it. I don't think he had much choice. He was under under tremendous pressure, but he negotiated. He did not conclude an agreement. There's a big difference between these two things. Mm. I mean, we all know how the actual agreement came about. So yeah, yeah. yeah. We we no, don't want to really. Yep. Sorry, the excuse sorry. is always the pressure. They always say we have the pressure, this kind of pressure, that kind of pressure. There's no if right to talk country, about the name. Why would you say if somebody country. talks about Israel's name? You know, let's yeah. change the name of Israel, you know? So you don't let them talk about changing the name to Israel. I agree. Let's say In you're principle, call I agree. Israel, North Israel and Palestina from tomorrow. It's not going to yeah. be like that. You know, you're not allowed to talk about my name. And the, even the, the referendum failed. But anyway, uh, when I'm talking, let me... Let me say hello to all the beautiful people watching us now. It's amazing that, that we are live today and this age and time and we have the opportunity to talk to such a knowledgeable person and a guest teacher, distinguished professor in many universities around the world, Professor Sam Baknin. Um, guys, I just want to tell you that the real war uh, with the psychopathology in our political representative is here. Everyone can see that they want to... Um, poison us they want to delete us they, it looks more like 1984 you know george orwell it's like it's it's the malignant home of the narcissistic uh, political gangster uh right now and we are attacking wow, right wasting now, no time right here <laughs> yeah we're going straight straight to to the point we are attacking <laughs> the political gangsters and their narcissistic malig malignant nature uh that's why we have the professor guest right now uh with us because he's a uh, 
a treasure chest of knowledge in this regard, in this subject, and he can ex explain to us um, why this is happening. And we, the willing, right now, took the initiative, the fight against the unmoral, the immoral, uh, right now, right here. And just so you know, the victory will be ours. The justice and the truth will prevail on the end. Uh, Macedonia and the, the, the world will survive this, this uh, attack, the globalist, again, the woke, I would call it, attack. And uh, they have awoken the, us, the, the, the sleeping giant. And we will take control eventually over our destiny. All right. Um, All right. Okay. Cool. Um... So let's. I think let's continue. How did how did your cooperation with the Macedonian with the various Macedonian governments ultimately finish? Uh, then I lost the elections as the same came to power, and that was the end of that. And I moved on. I became a professor in various universities, so, so I moved away from politics and economics. Mm. But I think we shouldn't waste time on on my ancient history in Macedonia, and we should talk about. For example, what Gotcha mentioned, I, I think it's more <laughs> more of interest to people than what happened to me with various ministers here and there. Well, well, they say they. I would, know be, I would be collaborating now again with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs if <laughs> if it gives you any comfort. Mm, okay. Um, well, let me say this: uh, they say more you know, you can better predict uh, the future. Uh, so let, let's make some predictions. I mean, you predicted that Gruyoski will become a prime minister and uh, I, uh, based on, on your knowledge, you had the right prediction. Uh, I, will, will this new political global elite will become our new gods? Apparently, we're becoming their slaves. They're, they're manipulating, we're eating their, their narrative and their propaganda for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Uh, the narrative is... is you can see it, everyone can see the narrative where it's going, you know, even on the Olympics. Um, will the freedom of speech uh, further deteriorate uh, in the global slave state, as you can see what happened to to this guy, the Wikipedia? Um, uh, not the Wikipedia, the... the Wikipedia. What you call uh, him? Yeah, yeah. Um, it is, it is the Wikipedia. Oh, you mean... Assange. Oh, oh, okay. Assange. Julian Assange. Julian Assange. Yeah. Yeah, he spoke outside of United States about WikiLeaks, uh, things. Mean. Yeah, WikiLeaks. Uh, he spoke uh, outside of United States. He's not even a citizen of United States. He spoke about United States, and he ended up in jail. So where is the freedom of speech? You understand me? Even us here talking right now, we are subjugated on this uh, law that is not allowing us to speak. You know, the freedom of speech. And uh, this is the narrative. Uh, will they... Uh, kill and bury deep underground the logic, the truth, the tradition, the gender roles, the family. Uh, will they manage to kill God in all of us? Uh, that's the question. And invent new commandments, new, new moral values uh, in the future, uh, if if the future is human at all. Uh, let's we, let's uh, go to, go to. Yes. Let's ask uh, the, the professor. Give us your your understanding of the state of. In, in which the uh, world geopolitics is right now. What do you consider is happening currently in the world? How are the battle lines politically drawn? And what wh what is what is happening, basically? What is your uh, estimation of what is going on in the world right now? I've been in another talk show, and when I started to explain what I think is happening, um, the host w got very angry, and I had to terminate the interview. <laughs> Because he confused <coughs> analysis with preference. Mm. When I analyze the world, doesn't mean that uh, this is what I want or this is what I like. But this is what's happening. Reality mm. is not always, you know, likable or acceptable or tolerable or bearable. Very, very often it's not. So what I see, first of all, it's important. I think history can be reconceived is an interplay between the masses and the elites. At each point, there's a different elite, of course. It could be the nobility. It could be rich people in capitalism. It could be, but there's always an elite. There's no mm -hmm. question about it. And then there are always masses, by definition. Sometimes the masses take over. Sometimes the elites take over. And when the masses take over, the elites do their best to destroy the masses. And when the masses take over, they do their best to destroy the elites. 
Today we are in a, a situation where countries like China and its satellite, Russia, because Russia has become a satellite of China. It's no longer an independent country in, in any meaningful sense. Iran and so on. These countries are offering an alternative model to liberal democracy and to capitalism. An alternative model, which is essentially an etatist model, a model of the control of the state. In these countries, free speech is not only non-existent, but is considered to be a crime or a violation of values, Confucian values, for example, in China. In the West, free speech exists, but it's meaningless. It has zero impact and zero influence. It is a form of self-deception. The, the elites allow the masses to express themselves in all kinds of podcasts and, <laughs> and so on. But this has zero impact on policy, on decision-making, on choices, on values, on narratives, zero impact. Mm -hmm. So the world is divided in two parts, where there is no pretension for democracy, for example, China and Russia and so on. There's no pretension of democracy. And there's no pretension of free speech. These countries are much closer to reality and much less deceptive they're much less deceptive. And then we have the West, or what's left of the West, because it's dwindling, it's declining, of course. What's left of the West, where there is a mass deception. Deception by the elites. The masses are lured and deceived into believing that they have influence once every four years, or because they have access to Amazon or Wikipedia, or because they can make podcasts. This is... This is a lie, a big lie. This is the big lie. And so the West is indistinguishable from China. The West is indistinguishable from Russia. The only difference is in Russia and China, they don't pretend. They don't fake. Do, do you think that this was always the case or do you think that this is a recent development? No, that was always the case. That Even from the beginning, what, 18th what century, 19th century. Always, always. Throughout human history. Throughout human history, the elites ruled. When the masses erupted and revolted, and of course, this happened, the French Revolution, Russian Revolution, and so on and so forth, it took a few decades, and the elites suppressed the masses in a variety of ways. The only difference is, in the last hundred years, the elites became much more sophisticated, much more subtle, much more clever, and whereas up to 100 years ago, the elites didn't bother to pretend, they were clearly the masters and the masses were the slaves. And there was no pretension about it. In the past 100 years, the elites learned how to deceive the masses, how to uh, tranquilize the masses with promises of power through democracy, empowerment through technology, and all, all, all the rest of the bullshit, if you excuse the word. Yeah. Mm the masses feel that they are empowered because they have access to cameras, streaming services, publishing services on Amazon. They, their voices are heard on YouTube. They think they are followed by millions sometimes. They have million followers, or millions of followers. And they confuse, the masses confuse this with real power. Real power has nothing to do with popularity, nothing to do with access nothing to do with technology and definitely nothing to do with a charade the masquerade of democracy nothing what, what do does it have to do with real power has to do with the allocation of economic resources starting with land and everything that comes out of the land so it's so agriculture the manufacturing then finance all of it comes essentially from the land and the allocation of economic resources determines the distribution of power. Power asymmetry exists because the allocation of economic resources is skewed, is not it's equal. asymmetric, basically. Not yeah. symmetric, not equal. Mm. And that's the end of it. You okay, can then, make but, but, but then, you can but make then how do you explain, how do you explain uh, something like Brexit? How do you explain something like Trump? Uh, like these are, these are things that we've witnessed the world's elites fighting against those occurrences and losing. 
Not really. The European Union wanted the United Kingdom out for a very long time. The, Euro the United Kingdom was a troublemaker. They undermined many initiatives. They refused to join the Euro. They, they were the enfant terrible of the European Union. And when the Euro United Kingdom left the European Union, everyone had a sigh of relief. Everyone was happy and they will never take the, the British back. On its part, the British had to make a choice between the Euro Europe and United States. There was a choice there. And they made their choice. They chose the Pacific, not the Atlantic. It is true the United States and the United Kingdom can gain access to China, Asia, and emerging markets everywhere. And so they created this axis. And if you look at history, if you look at history, with the exception of the last 400 years, the only exception, China was the superpower. That's, that's history. China was the superpower. And America and Britain were allies. There was an axis, special relationship between Britain and, her, and its colonies. Mm. So we are just back to normal. China is becoming the superpower again. And Britain belongs to the United States again. Europe it has an alliance, has a you know, European Union. Everyone thinks that this is unprecedented. That is not true. There have been three other unions of similar size previously. In the 13th century, there was the Zollverein, <coughs> which was a customs union of most of Europe, especially the northern part. And then later on, there was a coalition of Europe, which was augmented after the Vienna um, uh, conference in 1815, after Napoleon. And throughout this period, Various leaders in Europe created a European Union. Napoleon created a European Union. Adolf okay. Hitler. Adolf by Hitler, conquest. Never mind by which means. The fact is fact. Adolf Hitler created a European Union. <clears throat> Prior to these two, Charlemagne created a European Union. The unity of Europe in a supranational entity is the normal state of Europe, <laughs> not the abnormal state. And the, the Brexit is the normal state of relationship between the United Kingdom and Europe, because the United Kingdom was always in splendid isolation. They always distanced themselves from Europe. That's the history. Mm. And China being the superpower is the normal state of history, because when Europe was a toilet in the 10th century, China was already 4,000 year old civilization and culture and controlled the vast majority of the, of the world through later on the Mongol dynasties. Mo Mongolians who were essentially an extension of China after the 13th century, Mongolians conquered all of Europe, mm. almost all of Europe, not all, but almost all of Europe. In, so, yeah. no. they, 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 they got as far as Bulgaria, I think. <laughs> yeah, they, they got as far as Hungary, Bulgaria, <laughs> and parts of Spain. Mm. So, so when you look at, you need to look at history, not in the last 40 years, not even in the last 400 years. If you want to have real historical insights, you need to look at it over the last 4,000 years. But, but I mean... I, I do get your point, but I think that's kind of glossing over. It's generalizing over a lot of nuances. You know, it's a it's a different thing to unify as independent states and um, and build towards a union where everyone will be a um, uh, you know a participant, and it's a different thing to unify to occup occupy someone and um, uh, kind of force your ideology or your economics all, all on on top of them. Um, but even so, even so, I would say, when we look at Brexit, it is undeniable, undeniable that, like, are you saying that the entire media, the entire e, uh, EU elite, the entire uh, English uh, political elite, were they playing where, when they were actively uh, campaigning, when they were basically... Um, calling people that were calling for Brexit, they were calling them, I don't know, unwashed mas masses, uh, um, you know, fascist, whatever, you know. Uh, 
I mean, if they, if that's what they, and after Brexit, they made the separation super painful for, for uh, Britain. Um, are you saying that was all some sort of an elaborate scheme? Because we witnessed this in, no, in reality. Not elaborate scheme. I'm not prone to conspiracy theories. <laughs> but I can tell you that the European elite with, with whom I am acquainted, I'm not that acquainted with the British elite, but I can tell you that, of course, the British elite did not want Brexit because Britain was a net, net receiver of benefits in some areas like fishing and agriculture. But the European elite, this I can tell you with, with authority and certainty because I, I know and knew the people, were delighted, absolutely delighted. They were worried about setting a precedent. They were worried about setting a precedent, nothing to do with the United Kingdom. It was mm. about setting a precedent. Similarly, should Hungary secede tomorrow, there would be celebrations, secret celebrations, of course. <laughs> there would be celebrations in, uh, in the European Union headquarters and in the basements when no one sees them. <laughs> Some countries are undesirable. They're troublemakers. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to have Hungary, which is a tiny country. Mm. They're making troubles which cost the European Union way more than the GDP of Hungary. <laughs> So who needs this? Unfortunately, would you, that's would you not, say the that's same thing about Hungary. Poland, for example? No, Poland. Poland is a more is much bigger, and Poland is also, I think, much more uh, flexible, much more fluid in its political arrangements. Hungary is a dictatorship. I lived there for two years. It's a dictatorship. It's a uh, all but in all but name. I mean, the courts, the media, the, I've, I've given interviews to RTL. RTL is the A1, A1 of Hungary. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Bef before A1 was dismantled. I've given multiple, many interviews to RTL. And I got friendly with the journalists in RTL and so on and so forth. And I can tell you, there was terror, absolute terror and censorship and everything. It's a dictatorship. While Poland is not. In Poland, there are still active processes of, of, con of interpolitical conflict and dialogue and active coalitions. And so it's still more so-called democratic. All democratic processes are a sham because the real, the real positions of power, the real centers of power are not in the hands of the parliament or the government or the, they are behind the scenes. And it's not a conspiracy theory. That's how things operate. Mm. And so, okay, then, then, then let's talk about Trump then. Mm -hmm. What about how Trump? do we explain that in this world we, world view? Well, I just said that there are periods where the masses revolt and threaten the elites, and then there are periods when the elites take over or reassert control and suppress okay, so the you masses. would say in the U.S. right now we are living mm -hmm. through a period where the masses are wrestling yeah. control out of the yeah, elites. but the, the, it's temporary and they will fail. History shows that the elites always succeed. And today in the United States, the elites are fighting back in two ways. They are trying to delegitimize and criminalize Donald Trump and his movement. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, shoot him. And, shoot him. And on the other hand, on the other hand, members of the elite are trying to bribe Donald Infiltrate Trump. Infiltrate basically their way into, into Donald yeah, Trump. Take over. Yeah. Yeah. People like Elon Musk and so on. And the oil, the oil industry, and so so either either they will buy him or they will destroy him. It's a question of time. They will. Yeah, obviously, they already tried destroying him. <laughs> a couple they, of times. they haven't started yet. They haven't started yet, in my view. Uh, okay, uh, can I ask something? We're talking sure. uh, most about the methods. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the reasons by which uh, uh, these rationalizations are constructed by the politicians and this elite that we're talking about. What are the, the rationalization behind this? Is it narcissism pathology? Can we get a little bit deeper into this? Money, power, land, benefits, the good life. <laughs> what, what, more, what other motivations do you need? You can ask Hedonism. another question whether there is a specific psychological profile of people who desire money and power and, and sex and, you know. And yes, the answer is yes. 
people whose main motivation is the accumulation of power and money and so on and so forth, they are known as dark personalities. And dark personalities are basically narcissistic, psychopathic, and Machiavellian, manipulative. And a small percentage are sadistic. So this is the profile of, of the elites. And it's always been the profile of the elites. It is a fact of life that narcissists, psychopaths, and to a smaller extent, sadists, but mainly narcissists and psychopaths are manipulative. And they rise to the top and they take over. And they manage and they execute and they accomplish things because they are oblivious to the risks. And they believe themselves godlike. And in, they believe in impunity and immunity. They're untouchable. So they're taking, assume, they assume many more risks. And consequently, they are more accomplished because the more risks you assume, the higher the rewards if you succeed. So gradually, over centuries, these people, the narcissists, the psychopaths, they accumulated wealth. This is the work of Thomas Piketty. Thomas Piketty is a French economist who analyzed this process and proved conclusively that the vast majority of wealth today was not created by any economic activity. It was passed through generations, intergenerational transmission. And so it started with an original narcissist in the cave. He had a bigger, a bigger, you know, and he got the beautiful woman. And over the generations, these families handed the wealth from one to the next and so on and so forth. And today there is a concentration of power and money and access and contacts in these groups. And yes, you're absolutely right. There is a psychological profile. Another thing is, one of the big lies, because we are living in an environment of deception and fallacious narratives, also known as lies. One of the big lies is democracy. I mentioned it. Another big lie, if you work hard, you will succeed. If you work hard, you will have a good life. That is completely untrue. And this time I'm speaking as an economist, not as a psychologist. Social mobility is the way you move up the ladder, the way you progress socioeconomically in correlation to the work and the effort you put in. Social mobility in the United States, for example, is the lowest in the industrial world. Lowest. That, that's not true, no. That is true, unfortunately. No, 60% of, of uh, um, basically of the people in the wealthiest people in, in the US are people that have acquired new wealth and not no. inherited wealth. Social mobility in the United States is the lowest in the world. You may wish to update yourself. I, so, I, that's the last time I've seen, th there was a big, promise, I'm sorry. Go and there was yourself. a big uh, the, the difference between uh, um, social mobility in Europe and social mobility in the US. You're right, social mobility in Europe is higher. You're right. Social no, mobility no, no. in Sweden, in Sweden, in Germany, and so on is higher than the United States. You're absolutely right. There is a no, no, no. But my, 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 when I was reading it, it was basically what you were uh, reading. I okay, don't know so, what you so were maybe, reading, maybe we're, maybe we're talking about two different things. No, I'm not I'm talking, talking about, about two different things. You're I'm, wrong. I'm talking Simply. about. I'm talking about. Peter, uh, you can, you can be wrong. It happens. You know, no, you're wrong. Uh, but, 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 but I haven't made my point yet. My, my, my point was that uh, I, I read that in the U.S., most of the wealth accumulated is not uh, inherited wealth. Is basically produced well within, within a single generation. You are wrong. And while about in that. the U.S., while in the Europe, well, in Europe, all your information is wrong. So what are we here to distribute disinformation? You are collaborating with the elites. You're wrong. <laughs> You're wrong. Most of I, the world. I, the I might States. be wrong. That's not. That's You're not wrong. the problem. Not it's just. I'm just saying no something of. that I that I that I've read and that I've that I've. Uh, then you have not read made enough, aware. I, it might be wrong. wrong. It might be outdated. It, it's 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 not. Peter, you are wrong. End of story. I, I, I will, I will look this up for sure. Look it up. I encourage you to educate yourself. Let's proceed. So, so what, what we, we were saying before that um, you were saying that all wealth is basically... Uh, not all wealth. No, absolutely not all wealth. But the majority okay. of wealth... Ma is the majority of the wealth has been kind of, the work of chugging Thomas. along from the beginning of time yes, until, until this of, point. That is the work of Thomas Piketty, which is the authority on wealth in the world. I see. Piketty is P I K. Uh, e Thomas Piketty. Thomas Piketty, yeah. It's a oh. French, French economist. 
Okay. So automatically analyze the wealth in the United States also. And he proved conclusively that most of it is inherited, actually. He, uh, as to social mobility, there are the figures, the authoritative figures are published by the OECD and by the NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research. And the United States is at the bottom of social mobility. It is much less social mobile than, for example, Sweden and Germany, believe it or not. Now, of course, your protestations are example <laughs> of the brainwashing of the elite. It's the first time I've heard this. So, okay. I mean, obviously I'm going to protest. <laughs> this is this is example of the brainwashing of the elite. Because the elite wants you to believe that if you work hard, you can make it. That social mobility is high. That, you know, all you have to do is invest yourself and commit yourself and get educated and so on and so forth. And okay, I buy to, this. That's not this, the way to, to get ahead. How is the this, way to get ahead? This is the brainwashing of the elite. The way to get ahead is to marry into the elite or something like that. There is, unfortunately, at this stage, especially in the United States, but definitely I agree with you also in Europe, social mobility is low. Comparative, comparative social mobility is higher in Europe than in the United States. But in general, it's low. Mm. So today... Social mobility is a huge problem because, for example, wages wages have been frozen for well over four decades. Wages, the first increases in wages started in 2016. After 40 years, almost 40 years, depending on the country, 30 years, 40 years, that wages were frozen and did not go up. So while capital had huge returns, so people who had capital became richer. The rich became richer. The poor became poorer because wages were suppressed. A introduction of temporary work, introduction of you know Uber jobs and Mac jobs and so on and so forth. Work, as the millennials and Generation Z have discovered, work sucks. Work is to enrich the elite, basically. Income inequality today is the second highest in human history. Human history. Second highest. The first highest was in the 1920s, in the Gilded Age in the United States. And the second highest is today. And today, about 1% of humanity control, depending on your definition, that, that is debatable, but about 1% of humanity control more wealth than the lower 50% of humanity. And if you change the definition of wealth a bit, they control 90% of the wealth in the world. That's 1%. And that is the famous 99% or 1% movement. But, but, but isn't that the case in everything? In, in every hierarchy? Like the, the, the Pareto rule, for no, example? Income inequality is the highest it's ever been, except the 1920s. That again is a fact that you cannot argue with. I'm sorry, it has okay, not so been. Okay, so would, would we say century. that would we say that income inequality today is higher than what it was in basically uh, feudal or in uh, in uh, the fairer time in Egypt? Which part of second highest in human history is difficult for you to absorb? The part where uh, you know I I, ca I can't imagine that the inter income inequality was lower. In, in Pharaoh Egypt, well, then, it is, then deeply, it is in... You are deeply into stereotypes and deeply into <laughs> narratives. Deeply, you're not a scientist, clearly, evidently. Okay, what what so percentage of people in... You study in, a bit before you make statements like this. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm an electrical engineer, so okay. all, 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 I, all I, I know has come from... I will not an electrical engineer, I promise. <laughs> So, but 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 this is a serious question. What percentage of, of people would have wealth in, in Pharaoh Egypt? There have been studies of income inequality starting with the most ancient civilizations until today. The problem in ancient civilizations, the accumulation of wealth was not as massive as today. The richest people in human history are living today, are alive today. In absolute value, I would say yes, but in relative value. In also like... relative, in also relative value. Uh, they are living today by far, mm. by the way. People in the ancient world they had severe difficulty to accumulate wealth because productivity was much lower. And the wealth that they have accumulated was usually buildings or non-productive assets. 
there was there were no capital markets. There was no concept of interest even. Interest was forbidden until more or less the 15th century. So capital did not create capital. On the contrary, capital was eroded when there were, was inflation. Inflation was rare, very rare, but capital was eroded when there was inflation. Buildings and so on were non-productive. Uh, so they lived hand to mouth. The rich people lived hand to mouth. They had like a thousand workers and these thousand workers produced food and they ate the food that same year. If, if the next year there was famine or some natural, natural disaster, they were screwed. They didn't have reserves. If you read the Bible, for example, read the mm -hmm. Bible. So Pharaoh is absolutely in panic that the next year there will be no crop. The next year will be, will be famine, will be drought. So Pharaoh built big warehouses with the advice of a Jew, Joseph. Mm. He built big warehouses where he stored grain. He stored grain because he was terrified of the drought. But why was he terrified of the drought? Because they had no reserves. That was the problem. There was, and, and Karl Marx, by the way, was the first to make this observation. Karl Marx said that we are the we in capitalism have created surplus economies. There was no surplus before. We were living hand to mouth. And then in the Industrial Revolution, we started to create surplus. And this surplus is the cumulative wealth that made many people rich, starting with the industrialists. So we have transitioned from non-surplus to surplus economies, and that's why income inequality nowadays is the biggest in history, because these people are accumulating all the time, even if they don't do anything. If Elon Musk tomorrow stops working, doesn't do anything, and leaves his money in the bank, even with the current low interest rates in some countries, he would still get, he would still get a fortune, he'd make a fortune. Every year. And why isn't he doing that? Because he needs to work. What do you mean? He's a young man. He, he wants to go to work. He wants to uh, challenges. He wants to. This is something personal. So, so working hard. So, 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 so the, basically, the, the, what that means is working hard doesn't need to have wealth as a, as an ultimate goal because we have someone like Elon so. Musk who is already wealthy and he's still basically working possibly more than any other person. I that, agree. That, you know, so I agree. The motivation to work hard uh, can be related to money, but actually, rarely is. It rarely is related to money when so, you work so, hard. So, so it is good advice for someone to say, uh, um, "Let's let's let's take the monetary incentive out of it." Let's say, if you want a better life, if you want more meaning and purpose in your life, you need to work hard. I agree. Okay. I'm okay. saying the so, lie. So here, is, here, here we're finding common ground. No, I'm saying the <laughs> okay. lie is when you say to someone, if you want to progress in life, if you want to get rich, if you want the, the benefits of life, you need to work hard. That's the lie. The lie okay. is not about working hard. Working hard is good. Psychologically, by the way, working hard is good. Although, if you work the way we work today, many of the psychological benefits are missing. If you work, as self-employed, if you work alone, if you work in isolation, if you don't interact with other people, if you're not in an office, mm. that's actually, that has negative psychological impact. But if you work with other people, collaborate in teams, and you work hard, yeah, I, I agree with you. That has very great benefits psychologically. Well, uh, so you, you were talking about the elites and the masses always being kind of at odds at each other historically through the history of the universe, but uh, to, through of the, of the civilization. But I mean, we are seeing, like today, the civilization that we're living in today is markedly different than the civilizations uh, uh, previously. I mean, we can see with the advent of um, ideologies, with the advent of the ideology of democracy, with the advent of the concept of private property, with the advent of uh, the rule of law and the Leviathan state, which enforces the rule of law equally for strong and weak, um, I would say that that is proof enough that that civil that that at least if we're not 
if we're not out of that historic uh, anim animosity that you describe, that we are at least moving towards a direction where the masses, I mean, you could argue that it's relative, but no, they, Peter, they do, are, they do have... Seriously, you're seriously they, brainwashed. They do have... Seriously. No, no, but I'm, ask, I'm asking you a question. Say, would, would, you, would you you're say... You're telling would, me that the law applies equally to the poor and the rich? What do you no, mean? No, that, no, that, that's Which not what I'm saying. What, what I'm saying. what I'm saying is, a, a, a member of the masses today, argument, uh, uh, you could argument that he has more rights and more privileges than he had any time previously in the, in the history paper. of the universe. On paper. But there not on numerous, paper, I mean... No, on paper, absolutely. There are numerous studies that demonstrate that the rich are treated by the law in all its levels very, very differently to the poor. I, but very. even if I grant you that, the poor today, I'm, I'm not talking about the difference between the poor today and the rich today. But if I'm you talking don't about justice, the poor access, today. But you're confusing access, you're confusing narrative with outcomes. That you have access to the courts is meaningless if you don't get justice. Let's not talk about the courts, let's talk about the, the relative wealth. Like the poorest person today, uh, you, you would agree that it has, he has more wealth than any previous time in history, the Agreed. poorest person. So, so what? Uh, Agreed, you, you, yes. you would agree with that? Yeah. So yeah. I, I would say the result of that is the fact that, that uh, each individual person, even the lowest levels, uh, can, uh, there is a way for them now to own property, to uh, basically be paid, uh, I mean, you may, you may say it's not fair, but a wage for their work, you know. So there is a way for a normal, for a, um, a poor person, the bottom of the ladder, to have some semblance of a normal life uh, while having some, uh, the, the most prison, degree of control. The prison, con the prison conditions have improved. I agree. Okay, the can I can I say something better? Sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sam. Uh, better, you're talking about the percentage of democracy in, uh, in certain society. Uh, back in the days, uh, the percentage was lower. As Aristotle says, democracy is alive, it evolves. So we're talking about the percentage or percentages of democracy implemented in particular society. Uh, on a large scale, democracy is still a utopia. It doesn't exist. We're still slaves to the 1%, as Sam says. Uh, it's, it's just... Uh, different spectrum of democracy somewhere some people are more segregated some other country people have more rights and more uh possibility to climb up the ladder and achieve some success for a decent life uh but it's far far away as sam says it's far far away from the one percent in order to get to the one percent and become a, uh, i mean you don't have to be a part of the one percent in order not to be a slave most of the people in, in the world today are not slaves you i'm are not a slave sl you're not a slave most people in the world today are slaves, but to different things. How? They are slaves, they are slaves for example, to consumption. They are slaves to consumer goods. They are slaves, they are slaves to, to narratives, lies, like democracy, the rule of law. But upward, how are they slaves to them? They want, they want to consume those things. That's the slavery. <laughs> but but how is that a slave slavery is being forced to do something i mean not if always, if, so, if someone okay what's an example of, of a slavery, slavery that's the worst but, type of slavery is when you don't know that you're a slave that's the worst but, type of slavery. but if you not don't know that you're a slave and none of your existence is an existence of a slave you have the freedom to do what you want when you want it then in in what respect are you actually a slave actually majority of young people have woken up and they do realize the slavery element in capitalism and consumption, consumerism. What is that? They do realize the slavery element and they are opting out of society, of the workplace. Of So there's awakening, an awakening process that what has happened is I agree with you that the conditions in the prison have improved. Even I would say dramatically improved. There's more food, more entertainment. You have a television now. You have a refrigerator, and you think because of that you're not a slave. First of all, you're a slave to the television and the refrigerator. But you're a slave in mentality. You will not think to undermine the established order because you have a television and a smartphone. That's your slavery. 
Your slavery is you'll be afraid to lose your smartphone. You'll be afraid to lose your miserable job with pitiable income. You'll be afraid to lose the bribes that the elites gave you. You will be But, afraid. I mean, you don't have to have that job. You can, you can, you can look for another job. Whatever job. Whatever job. So doesn't all jobs uh, have, have pitiful wages? All jobs are pitiful. Of course My are. job doesn't. Your, all jobs are. You are getting a fraction of what you should be getting, what you should be paid. How do I know? Because other people are getting insanely rich, disproportionately rich. But For example, a typical <laughs> manager, a typical chief executive officer in all any company in any country in the world makes 600 to 6,000 times the salary of the worker. A typical chief executive officer. And you, you, you think that's not fair? I have no interest in fairness, right and wrong. <laughs> I have interest in reality. Oh, so you're saying that's reality. the situation. Okay. I think it does not reflect a differential of productivity, if that's what you're asking. Yes. What is, oh, so, what so, is so, so, so in that sense... So, so if you're saying that someone is getting uh, uh, compensated for uh, uh, not congruent to the amount of work um, in a the, higher contribution, the contribution, uh, uh, yeah. So, so, so he's not being uh, so he's being disproportionately compensated for his for his contribution. But that's the definition of unfairness. That's up to you. I'm not. I'm not interested in fairness. Not fairness. And so on. I'm interested in reality. You have a right. Would Would, would you agree? Right. Would you agree that a CEO has much more responsibility about nothing the justifies? Than what... Nothing justifies. Nothing justifies. Forty-five billion dollars salary. End of story. Who, who's making forty-five billion? Go? Elon Musk. <laughs> Somebody, somebody. He's now making 45 billion. That's Elon his net worth. He signed a contract for 45 billion dollar salary. You are not updated. What? But is that a yearly sal salary? It's his salary, uh, options, and everything. Even if it is not yearly, even if it is for the next hundred years, it's not justified. I mean, can I ask? Maybe, I mean, if it's if it's for the next hundred years, maybe it is justified. You know. Well, it's not for the next hundred. <laughs> But my, my point is, like, I mean, come on, no one's well, making $45 salary, billion. I, I agree that the people, way. there are people worth billions of dollars, no. but that's 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 no. the combined worth of all no. their holdings and no potential. People, no, there are no people worth billions of dollars. None. But, but in reality, there are. No one is worth billions of dollars. That is, again, your brainwashing. No one is worth billions of dollars. Oh, you mean is, like in actuality they're not worth? As a person, they're not worth. No, no one is worth the salary of billions of dollars. I'm understand. saying their their net worth, their their uh, combined the value of the stuff they most own. Most of the net worth, most of the net worth of the one percent, has nothing to do with work or productivity. I, that, that, with, that we agree. Has to do with capital markets, and has oh, to do with inheritance. Can I ask then, what is the ceiling of, of the capitalism? How far this bubble is going to blow and go? Uh, these non-tangible assets introduced into the marketplace, uh, the consumerism that you're talking about, the pathologies uh, related with the consumerism, consumerism in our day and age. Uh, uh, is there any relation in this with, uh, with the increase in feminism and, uh, and all of this, uh, the pathologies related to... to uh, this new time and age that we live in uh, regarding the, the expansion of capitalism and all this consumerism being uh, in the narrative in all mainstream media? I think the, these are two questions, basically. I'll answer the first and then the second. The first one is how long can it last? Indefinitely. As long as there are people like Petal who are happy, <laughs> happy with his smartphone, happy with his podcast studio, happy with his job, there will be no revolution, of course, and capitalism will continue indefinitely. And I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not criticizing Peter for being happy. I'm criticizing him for not being uh, woke, not being open, not realizing that he's being brainwashed. I'm, I'm criticizing him for accepting the narrative as true when it's manifestly false. If you study the data, but I'm not criticizing him for making this choice. Peter has a right to say. I am happy with my smartphone, I'm happy with my television, I'm happy for, with my job, and fuck you. That's it. It's good enough for me. And I'm not gonna, I don't want to change this. I don't want to change this. I'm happy as I am. He has a perfect right to say this. 
and there's no point or possibility to argue with him because that's a value judgment. It's a value judgment. But many of the statements he made are not supported by data, and that is where we part ways. The, so the, the answer to your first question, as long as the elites bribe the masses, bribe them, this is mito e corruptia, as long as the elite bribe the masses, and the masses are considered a bribe to be reasonable and acceptable and desirable, then we will continue to have this regime forever and ever. Amen. Your second question, I think, is even more interesting, and that is a connection between feminism and capitalism. Capitalism is not an organizational principle. It's not a way to organize society. That's a common mistake to believe so. Capitalism is a way to allocate resources. Capitalism tells you how to allocate scarce resources in order to produce more and distribute more. So it's an alloc allocation, allocative system. But capitalism uh, started off as an allocation mechanism. And then, as actually I think Petau said, if I remember correctly, then it became an ideology. And the ideology of capit capitalism involves elements which have nothing to do with capitalism. For example, growth. There's nothing in capitali capitalistic theory that, dis that talks about growth. Growth is not an integral ele element of capitalism. You can have capitalism in an economy which is stagnant over 200 years. It would still be capitalism. So growth has nothing to do with capitalism. Growth is an outside import, something, a transplant on capitalism. Mm. When you combine capitalism with the philosophy of growth or the ideology of growth, what you come up with is known as consumerism. Because you need people to consume more and more. You need more and more people to consume more and more in order to produce growth. Otherwise, there's no growth. And what happened in the 20th century is that 150 million men lost their lives. 150 million consumers lost their lives. And there was a shortage of consumers and a shortage of manpower. That's a fact. <laughs> Sorry, when, when, when you, you were saying, when did throughout this the century, Throughout the 20th century, 150 million okay, okay. men lost their lives uh, artificially, not because of natural... Causes. As part of the wars, yeah. Wars, and there was the pandemic, the, the influenza yeah. pandemic in 1918. 50 million, 50, 60 million men died of that pandemic alone. There were 20, another 25 million men who died in the, the Second World War. 20 million men died in the First World War. A total of 150 million. So these 150 million people were consumers. And there was a shortage of consumers and a shortage of manpower. The capitalists panicked. You can see it in the work of Keynes, Keynes, the economist. Mm. There is panic, absolute panic. Keynes says, wow, what are we going to do? to regulate unemployment, to stabilize inflation. I mean, there was a panic. And then they came up with a brilliant idea. Let's introduce women into the workforce. <laughs> Let's convert women into consumers by giving them, giving them a salary, by taking them out of the home, bringing them into factories, into offices, into we will be able to justify giving them a salary and they will consume this salary. So here is the engine of growth that we were looking for because of a shortage of men. This is not just a theory. That's exactly what happened. Already in the First World War, 20 million women started to work in factories, especially munitions factories and so on. During the Second World War, 45 million women joined the workforce. They work in transportation, they work in medical services, they work in education, they work in, in uh, munitions factories and so on. Suddenly, tens of millions of women joined the workforce. Prior to that, the majority of women in the 1940s and 1950s were housewives. And suddenly, there were another 
initially 100 million new consumers. And these new consumers uh, rebooted, rebooted the post-war economy and became, of course, part of society. But wait, 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 weren't they more consumers when they were housewives because they were they did didn't need to get paid? Only no. uh, the, their husband needed to get paid, but they would still consume. And there, there, there are uh, research. There is research that says even when 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 women were not um, uh, voting and um, and working, they had more control over how the household income was was spent. Yes, but there was the a men. single there was a single salary. The yeah, salary but. The that means they would men, consume. Um, the salaries I mean, of men actually, Petal, you really, really must begin to accept the authority of data. Data, no. not your opinions, not your prejudices, not your stereotypes. Data. Here's the data: the salaries of men after the Second World War, during the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s up to the end, up to 1979 salaries of men exploded went up dramatically add to this the salaries of women so the aggregate salaries aggregate salaries went up dramatically because the men were working they were getting paid more and now there was a second salary at home of the woman which did not exist before you're right that women made important decisions about consumption when there was a single salary but after that there was more salary not less salary to distribute and to consume and this definitely restarted and rebooted the engine the economic engine post war the problem is this when you give people money they discover their power when they discover their power they want rights when they want rights this creates conflict societal conflict any time there is a group who de- which which demand new rights this creates conflict and so feminism transitioned from the sec- first and second phase which were pre-war feminist transition to the third wave and the fourth wave which is a very aggressive conflict based um kind of variant of feminism women became wage earners today in the united states 43% of all primary wage earners are women under the age of 25 women make more money than men under the age of 25 if you take the overall women make less money than men but under the age of 25 which is the the, the future women make more money than men women are 1.8 times more educated than men in degrees ms ma msc and phd almost two thirds are women one third are men i mean but again who is educating them it's the establishment that's educating them. the establishment is also women. and if it's the educating majority, if the, the establishment is 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 educating them they're educating them to be good slaves right good consumers yeah good consumers right sure. so 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 i mean yeah so women women are definitely the future because women are much better educated than men in i'm talking about specific countries of course i'm not talking about afghanistan no. <laughs> but united states for example women are much more educated than men and education is the major predictor of lifelong income the more you are educated the more income you make lifelong that's the major predictor the number one so because women are much more educated they're going to make much more money because they're going to make much more money the their dependency on men cultural societal dependency but also economic dependency has vanished and when you're not dependent on someone you have the tendency to rebel and revolt of course <laughs> especially if you've been a slave for 10000 years so Uh, back to you got said the you're right to connect capitalism to feminism but not the not the pure form of capitalism but the ideological capitalism of consumerism and growth and you know this kind of capitalism now conformism over uh, just let me finish the yes 
because women women took over of professions that used to be male professions. For example, in the 19th century, the vast majority of doctors and the vast majority of nurses, nurses, medical nurses, were men, not women. Today, it's women. In the 19th century, the vast majority of educators, teachers, were men. Today, overwhelmingly, it's women. In the 19th century, there was no female judge and extremely few female lawyers. Today, majority of lawyers are women and about 40% of judges are women. In the lower courts, majority are women. So women are taking over sectors, professions, and these are not minor professions. There are two exceptions where women failed to make inroads. They failed to take over. And that is high tech. In the high tech sector, women are underrepresented massively. And um, um, no, management. In management, women, women are underrepresented. And when I say management, it includes politics because politicians are managers. They manage the state. But it's a question of time, of course. We have Kamala Harris. You know, this would have been unthinkable in the 1950s. It's a question of time. It will take another 100 years, another 50 years. The future is family. I would, yes. I would um, disagree about the time uh, factor that you mentioned, because I claim that women are not uh, capable of being leaders because they bring their decisions based on uh, emotions and um, not like a man based on uh, a ratio. Uh, so Everyone that's why... makes decisions based on emotions. Come on. <laughs> no, 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 no. This, this is... time I agree with Peter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sometimes okay. I agree with agree. Agree. I'll agree to disagree, but um, women make their decision based on uh, feelings and emotions. Men are more rational. That's why 80% uh, of the debt in the United States are, is owed by women because they are manipulated by the commercials. Oh, you're gonna make this is gonna make you younger 10 years. Boom, buy it right away. We on the other side, men, we have different process of thoughts. Do we need this? Is it worth it? And do I need, need it to buy it? So that's why the, the debt is 20% for, for men. Uh, I was going to mention conformitism um, and consumerism, as you mentioned yourself, uh, affecting higher percentage of women. And that's why, because uh, they're e e more easily manipulated by the marketing companies and uh, propaganda to buy uh, into the the uh, consumerism. That's why uh, I don't believe they are capable of being good managers or leaders. Or um, how many women scientists do you know? I don't want to sound, uh, uh, you know, uh, feminist. I mean, um, toxic. But how many scientists are women out there? Don't worry, to you're men? not sounding feminist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> you're not. Go sir, relax. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but I would disagree that women are good leaders. Otherwise, it would be proven in history. Uh, and I would disagree that women are. Uh, when when did I say that women are good leaders? When did I say that women are good leaders? Well, I you said, said a question of time. No. Okay, I was going to ask you that. Where, yes. Okay, where is going to take us? My question, where that's going to take us? The the higher percentage of females in the leading positions, knowing uh, that they bring the decisions uh, based on emotions, where that's going to take us? What kind of society are we going to live in? If the judges, most of them are women, teachers are women, they don't have no punishment. And there is a different, totally different system of education and judging and, and mental process thought. So where that takes us? So first of all, I... I hope I made it clear. I, at the very beginning, when I told you about the other talk show that I had to <laughs> Brexit, mm. uh, I'm not here to ex to express my opinion. I'm interviewed here as a scientist, not as an. Uh, I have very clear opinions, by the way. Very clear opinions. Yeah. Some of these opinions actually match P Petal's opinions, but they are not supported by data. Numbers. So we're, when the by numbers, by data, by information, by by you know, so I'm forced to follow the evidence where it takes me, even when I don't like it at all. I do not like the coming world, which is going to be uh, not patriarchy but matriarchy. I don't like this world. 
You are right, by the way, that women make decisions differently to men. The psychological studies show that it's not true that women make decisions based on emotions and men don't. That is a myth. There are many studies about this, not a few, and they are over 70 years. So even when women were not consumers, were not so, we have a lot of data about women, feminine decision making, and it's not based on emotions. On the contrary, by the way, in some cases, women are much more calculated, cold, skimming, cunning, and manipulative than men, in some cases. But you are right that they make decisions differently. Whereas men make decisions usually based on some criteria. The criterion could be the law, for example. Women tend to ignore formalisms, formalism like the law, or formalism like, like um, no uh, entry criteria, or they tend to ignore rules, they tend to ignore formalism. And instead, what they try to do, they try to create consensus. Women are consensus driven. So if a woman has conflict between what the law says, and co happy consensus, she will choose happy consensus and ignore the law. Which, of course, <laughs> would make women not so good judges. Yeah. Similarly, we have a big study about uh, students who apply to universities and people who got interviewed for jobs, job interviews. And so we made the study like this. There were women who made the interview and men who made the interview. There were women interviewing the students and the job applicants and men interviewing the students and job applicants. The men adhered, followed clear criteria. This guy has this education. This guy has this experience. This guy, V, 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 V. Okay, you get the job, bye. They didn't pay attention much to the, pers to not so much to the personality, impressions. They were much more objective. Women, on the other hand, tried to make peace. They try to restore harmony. They put emphasis on consensus and so on. So ultimately, they made very different choices to men. And these choices reflected mediocrity. For example, when women were confronted with someone who was brilliant, they ruled him out because brilliant people make trouble. So women reduce the level of the average intelligence of the applicants that they accepted. They, women prefer harmony to intelligence. Also, when women came across people who were very experienced, they ruled them out. Because if you are very experienced, you will make trouble to other people who are not experienced. There will not be harmony. So yes, you're absolutely right that women decide differently, not based on emotions based on empathy, on consensus, on networking. And all these concepts are alien to men because men are goal-oriented. What men asks, can this guy do the job properly? What a woman asks, will this guy be a troublemaker? Is he going to be liked by the other people? Is he going to collaborate well? If he has a new idea or if he disagrees, will he be pleasant about it? Will he not engage in conflict? Will he even shut up and not share his view? Because others don't agree. So the emphasis of women was much more consensual and emphasis of men was on obtaining goals, which would explain why women are underrepresented in science, in management, in, in high tech, in, because these are goal-oriented uh, situations where the enterprise or the institution measures output and outcomes. There's, they don't care much about internal dynamics. They care, are you getting the job done? You need to do it at midnight, do it at midnight. We don't care, just get it done. You know? And women care about the workplace, the environment, the pleasure, the pleasant, to, to be nice, to be kind, to be empathic, to be compassionate, to be things that have nothing to do with accomplishing the goal. You know? So the world is going to look very different.
and I'm not. I'm, I happen to dislike so it. So what are you what you saying? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. What you're saying is the quality will suffer in the long run. Yes. Don't fly, yes. guys. I confirmed, <laughs> I, confirmed I confirmed it, and studies confirmed it. Women prefer mediocre men, mediocre uh, people. They dislike. I'll give you. I'll give you a shocking study. Shocking study. By the way, huge study, so it's not a mistake. When women were, were asked, would you date a man of 120 IQ? No, of 100 IQ. Women said, yeah, not very exciting, but okay, if there's nothing else. Would you date a man 120 IQ? Yeah, 120 IQ, we will date, definitely, because he has advantage on the 100 IQ men. And now, listen well, shocking. Will you date a man with 140 IQ? No way. No way. Women are afraid of exceptionalism. They are afraid of the outlier. Women want average statistic. Women want to mediocre everything. They want the middle, the middle ground, the golden way. You know, they don't want trouble. They don't want. And of course, there's no progress without change. Schumpeter, the famous, uh, the famous economist, called it creative dis destruction. You need to destroy and to disrupt in order to have progress. You cannot continue the same path into new things. Novelty, new things require the destruction of the old. And women are not capable of this. They maintain the status quo. They maintain what exists. They, they like mediocre people. And they are terrified of super intelligent people, super accomplished people, disruptors, new ideas, invention. They don't like that. <laughs> they absolutely don't like it. Okay. Um, so I, I, I don't want to go too much further in, in this direction. Um, it, it's actually, uh, we, we have, I think, a li uh, little more than half an hour to go. So um, it was more interesting for me the point of disagreement that we had previously but you guys went on a on a much too lo larger tangent i don't know if i should go back but i do want to uh pose uh, sam with one question uh and that's to go back to the kind of slave mentality because i do get i do get the feeling that this podcast is ca kind of casting capitalism so the ideology or the economic system doesn't matter in a in a uh, overly negative light uh so <laughs> Two, basically, what, what I wanted to ask uh, um, Sam is, from a, from a psychologist's perspective, so you were saying that people are being conditioned into consumerism, they are being conditioned into wanting things that they don't necessarily need, and they are being paid, including bringing, up, bringing in the women into the workplace to, to pay them more money so they have more disposable income, so they can basically uh, uh, cons consume more and spend it more. And when, these are, when these I are brought facts. up hmm? these effects, okay. everything you said until now, these effects. Okay, so so I do I did represent your position correctly. Okay, so not my position. Uh, these facts. I mean, there are women exactly. in the workforce. I mean, what you, what you are trying to yeah. say, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then I kind of countered, which I don't think what we we, do, we really discussed with, but they really do want those things. So mm -hmm. from a purely psychological uh, uh, um, perspective, in their internal kind of awareness of, of themselves and the world, these people feel like they want something and it makes them happy to consume it, you know? Um, no, no, it doesn't. But, but let, me, let me just pose my, 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 my kind of thesis. But you're so, starting with the wrong foundation. People are not happy nowadays more than they used to. They're much less happy. Um, okay, uh, but, but, but my point is, how can you call someone a slave if they basically perceive themselves it, like from a psycho psychological perspective, if a person doesn't perceive themselves as slaves, if he doesn't see the boundaries that are that need to be there in order to be to be to be able to define a slave, if they don't see them, if they don't feel them, then what is the actual difference between them being a, a real slave or a perceived slave? That's what I'm interested. In. Okay, it's a good question. It's a good uh, philosophical question, of course. Nothing much to do with psychology, but it's a philosophical question. But before we come to it, two, just two comments. First of all, I'm all for capitalism. It's the most efficient method of allocation of resources, and it yields wonderful outcomes. Even China agrees. 
Even China has capitalism. I'm against the ideology of capitalism, which is growth forever at any cost, environmental cost, any cost. Consumerism as a form of addiction. I'm against this. This is the ideology of capitalism. And it has nothing to do with capitalism. Capitalism was invented essentially in the 16th and 17th century, mainly in the Netherlands, the Baltic states, and so on. And it has nothing to do with it. It's a capit original capitalism was Puritan, Puritanism. These people were against consumerism, totally against consumerism. Okay, that's point number one. Point number two, in all our conversations, we must always follow where the evidence leads, even if we don't like it. And many, very often, we don't like it. We, not only you, we. The fact is that people are much less happy than they have ever been since records began. I don't know what happened 2,000 years ago. Since we started to keep records about the well-being and happiness of people, which was more or less in the 1840s, that's when we started to keep records, today people are the least happy ever. People have never been more unhappy. That's a fact. Second fact, people are much sicker than they've ever been. They live longer, but they're much sicker. Now, it could be that they're much sicker because they live longer. Could be. Mm. But these are two facts. When we ask people why they are unhappy, and there is an, um, an annual happiness study that has been conducted for decades now. And this study also ranks countries. So I'm Finland familiar with it. Finland is the happiest, and I don't know. And, and also the biggest consumer of antidepressants, but yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> as shocked as you that Finland is the happiest. I mean, these people are, are drunk at 10 o'clock in the morning. No exception. <laughs> hey, that's that's the cure for, for you know, basically unhappiness, so happy, obviously, yeah. But um, when we ask people, uh, these are so we have longitudinal studies, we, we look at people all over, and then we, we pick a group, it's called focus groups. We pick a group and we ask them, why are you unhappy? The number one answer is, I don't have agency. I don't have control over my life. That's the number one answer. And I think it's a great definition of slavery. Now, as to your question, you say, if people are not aware that they're slaves, can we call them slaves? Well, people are not aware that they're psychotic. Can we call them psychotic? The overwhelming majority of people with psychotic disorder are not aware that they're psychotic. They believe they're hallucinations and illusions. Can't we call them psychotic? Um, narcissists don't know that they're narcissists. They would argue with you that they're not narcissists at all. <laughs> and yet they are. In short, self-awareness is a very bad, very bad test as to your real situation in life. So, slavery, I think, is defined in two ways. Your options. If you have many options, the, the more options you have, the less of a slave you are. <clears throat> and your internal state, to some extent, not necessarily self-awareness, but do you feel good? We call it ego syntony. Are you ego syntonous? Do you feel good with yourself? The answer to the second question is easy. Majority of people feel bad, not good. We know today that 35% of the adult population in industrialized countries report depression and anxiety. 35% report that they are depressed or anxious in a clinical way that requires medication and intervention. That's unprecedented. Unprecedented. Never, ever happened before. We know that in 1980, there was a giant study on friendship. People reported in 1980 that they had 9.8 best friends. Best friend means you can confide, you can share, you can mm. ask for advice. In the year 2020, the study was conducted again. People reported that they have 0 0.9 best friends. From 9.8 to 0 0.9. 
We know that 42% of adults in, 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 in the West, especially United Kingdom, uh, United States, I'm sorry, 42% of adults are lifelong singles. We know that the frequency of sex has collapsed, deteriorated to the point of vanishing almost, especially among young people. All these are indicators of unhappiness. No one can equate this with happiness. These are indicators of unhappiness. So internal state, as far as I'm concerned, is slavery. In other words, you're not happy and there's nothing you, you do about it. So that's slavery. Options. We are being brainwashed into believing that we have many options, that there is social mobility, that it's only up to us to shape our lives, that we are in control, that there's nothing, if we put our mind to it, there's nothing we cannot accomplish. We are being told all these lies time and again, that we affect the political process through democracy, that technology empowers us and we can do anything now. We, are, we have a smartphone that is greater than NASA in the 1960s. So we are being told all these, um, mostly lies, not all, but mostly lies. And so we have the illusion of options because we have choice. People confuse choices with options. We have a lot of choice. You go to Amazon, you have 3.7 million books to choose from. That's a lot of choice. But what are your options to buy a book? Amazon. And only Amazon. Amazon controls 87% of the book market in the world. So you have a lot of choice, but you have no options. It's the same in the search engine area. It's the same in artificial intelligence. It's the same in operating system. And it's the same in the political process. In more and more countries in the world, there's only a single party to choose from. And in the best case, two. Even the United States, the new Athens, has only two parties, which frequent, I mean, increasingly are difficult to distinguish. Two parties. So, I mean, on paper, yes, but I mean, in, in the Republican Party, you have like Trump is nominally in the Republican Party, but most of the Republican Party considers Trump an existential threat. So I don't know about most, some, yes. I don't know about most. The statistics yeah. disagree with you, but the, the, the establishment. Trump. Of, so. the, of the Republican Party. So, I mean, on paper, yes, but in reality, I mean, you can be for Trump. But what does it mean if you don't support Trump? You're dead. What? Okay. So, in, it, that's, that's what I'm saying. You have a choice, but you don't have options. Ultimately, when you go to the ballot box, you have not, no options. You have a lot of choice, but this is illusory choice. It's an illusion. You have no options. Everything is monopolized, everything is cartelized, everything is concentrated, everything. And this is typical of situations where you have il an elite or groups, different elites, that acquire more and more, more and more money, more and more power, more and more access. Today, but, but, but don't you think that's the, the, the reason because of the reason for this case is because now, in order for, for you to have more options, uh, the stuff that you have to basically um, create is is bigger, is more abstract. You were bringing up, for example, search engines. Like to make an, an engine now, it's previously for you to have a choice whether to move to the neighboring town or you know get on a, a train and and move out somewhere really far away. It's comparatively easy to offer options in in that kind of scenario. But now the civilization, the world has become so abstract and so complicated that the Basically, the, the the it's become more compli more difficult to offer yeah, options. This, this is called in yeah. economics barrier to entry. Yeah. The barriers yeah. to entry are higher, but that's exactly what I'm telling you. They are brainwashing you to believe that you have options and choice. I mean, but actually, because of barriers to entry and other things, not only barriers to entry, so, uh, options are dwindling. They're going down, not up. And you're right, the complexity of the world, the barriers to entry is one reason. But the fact is that you are living in a world that is increasingly more concentrated, increasingly less diverse, increasingly more focused on the elites and what they own. But is that really true 
on a micro level. I mean, I, I do, micro get, level, I, I do get, book? I do Listen, get your point about on, the, on abstract, the macro level. On micro level, where can you buy my book? I can tell you that when I published my book the first time, 30 years ago, it was available in nine marketplaces: Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Smashwords, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Today, you can buy it only on Amazon. That might be. I'm, I'm not arguing against that. The, the, the what I'm arguing against. Like I could, I could retort to that that um, the the civilization now has moved on from the uh, the basic book as a as a as a way to transfer knowledge. Uh, right now, I mean, you can you can have uh, hyper indexed uh, books, which are which we now call web pages we are not talking or about repositories. The character of books. We are talking about how many options you have. But because there is, there is, options. but there's That's fewer and fewer That's demand for there's books. Fewer and fewer options. But the demand for books is also lowered. W wouldn't you agree? Mm, that actually, people are getting their, they're getting their information no, and knowledge is, from different that's sources. Not actually, that's not it's true. Not also. A, it's not about books, Peter. It's not about books. It's about the principle. About uh, yes, the, exactly. Yeah, it's about know, the options. How free are you? But, no, but, options but, but let's say, let's say on a micro level, me, as I walk through my daily life, I mean, I understand, you know, uh, fine if I want to buy a book, whatever. But on my minute to minute experience, Everything in your life is monopolized by elites and you have usually a single option. Almost everything. Including the, polit including the political choices. The, YouTube. The violence, but the political choices are not my minute to minute decision. YouTube is your minute to minute. Very... Amazon is your minute to minute. They are all your minute to minute. YouTube is your minute to minute. There are other platforms. Rumble, Schmumble, they're nonsense. They're bullshit. There's only YouTube. Come on, they're, they're not bullshit. They're trying they're bullshit. their best. There's only YouTube. <laughs> There's only YouTube. I have, I'm, a ve I'm, I'm present on all of them. I have the statistics. So are Forget, we, yeah. forget yeah. it. It's only YouTube. It's only Google. It's only Amazon. It's only, you know... Wherever you look, in every field, by the way, not only I'm talking oil, retail, I mean, you name it, we are I, down. I, to, I, we are down to one or two competitors. I understand and it's hard to down? challenge. It's hard to challenge, for example, the the Google in the search space. But I mean, Google is is um, now, which increasingly. Part of the, of which part of the following argument you find very difficult to understand? The less options you have, the less free you are. Can you argue with that? No, no, that I completely okay, so agree with that. Why does it matter why you have less options? The less options you have, the more, the less. Okay, more. this is my retort to that. Before uh, uh, the concept of internet search uh, uh, existed, you had less options in different places, and it did look like that. Those were the limits that you had. But then, uh, uh, as the the concept of a search engine came out of thin air, Alta Vista, you know, Yahoo. Whatever they're they're all dead now, but the uh, the concept of a search engine appeared. Better, Multiple the, players the started fewer playing. Options, and, the and fewer, you're, 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 I don't know what you're talking about, nor am I interested in what you're talking about. The fewer options you have, the less free you are, and no amount of of wizardry with words will change this. <laughs> it's it's not wizardry, okay, and it's not only search engine. It's for example retail space in the United States, Kmart just closed down and that left walmart as the only supermarket chain in the united states end of story retail in the united states started in the 1890s long before search engines it's nothing to do with modern technology it's in everywhere it's in everything even in airlines you have much fewer airlines than you had Actually, in the United States, you have three airlines. You used to have well over 300. This is a fact. And the fewer options you have, the less free you are. This cannot be argued with. This is so simple that there's no need now to ask, why do you have fewer choices? And they, It's not interesting for the conversation. I agree. But less that free. And less I free is the definition of slavery. I agree, but it's. It, I think we're looking at this in a, in a very narrow way. When we look at airlines, when okay, we look better, at search on, engines... On, on. You're beginning to talk nonsense. Move on. No. 
the, 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 my, my question is like right now no, if I need to search if, topic, no? if I need to search I don't uh, go to Google I Beta, go to don't AI stuck, search now don't get stuck move to the next question yes it's an illusion of choice basically and, it's uh, not it's even that you don't even have a choice is. if you want to buy books you go to yeah, exactly other. no choice even uh, uh, even the illusion of choice you want. Yeah, in, in, in a democracy. The illusion of choice. Exactly. That's what I was going to talk about. Politics, it's an illusion of choice. It's not even a choice because the democratic representative, they should be representative uh, who came out of the people. But the people did not uh, choose them or select them. The, uh, the president of the political party selected them individually uh, and uh, they're his own representatives on the ballot list. So basically, we are not voting in a democracy for the democratic representative in the parliament because those representatives did not come on the ballot. Uh, I did not vote for them to come on the ballot. So everybody else can vote. So they are selected by one single person con who who has uh, leverage over them. And um, it is a uh, oligarchy on the bottom line. It's a- Yeah. Uh, in political, that in political a, science, yes. in political, so just to answer this uh, observation, in political science, we distinguish two types of democracy. We have, we have participatory democracy and we have representative democracy. The global lie, which is sold by the elites in the process of brainwashing, is that participatory democracy is the only possible democracy because there are too many people. That is, of course, nonsense. Already 40 years is possible to have participatory democracy. Now, the difference between the two. Participatory democracy is when every voter directly chooses someone. Uh, representative democracy is when voters choose someone who chooses someone. So in, in representative democracy, you choose someone and that someone makes the choice. While in participatory, everyone votes for everyone. It was not possible until 40 years ago because of technological problems. There was no technology available. But starting 40 years ago, and definitely in the last 10 years, this is totally possible. Tomorrow you can have participatory democracy in Macedonia. Everyone in a smartphone will download an app and they will vote through the app and the results will be known within less than five minutes. It's totally possible. And yet, there is not a single country in the world, with the exception of Switzerland, that allows for particip participatory democracy. All the countries in the world have intermediaries. They have brokers. They have layers between the voter and the system. So in the United Kingdom and in Israel, you have the party, the political party. You don't vote for directly. You vote for the political party, and the political party chooses the people. In the United States, you have the Electoral College. The Electoral College is often divorced from the popular vote. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. She won the popular vote by 3.7 million votes. And yet, Donald Trump got elected because of the system of Electoral College. Electoral College has nothing to do with the popular vote. Yeah, it's, it's not a democratic tool. It's a republican it's a, tool. It's not a democracy. And and uh, and I can go country by country by country. Not to mention, of course, China, Russia. I'm not talking about this. Do you think that participatory democracy will increase the options of people? Of course. In participatory democracy, what will happen? Participatory democracy, you will receive on your smartphone a list. And the list will say, for prime minister, this. For, for representative of your region in the parliament, this. So you'll have, let's say, 20 names. And you will have an app. And the app will open the page with the 20 names. And next to each name, you will have a checkbox. Yes, no. Simple. Single page. Yes, no. End of story. Will take you, if you're very slow, two minutes. And the most important thing, because it's a smartphone, the results can be known within minutes. I understand logistically that's a solution. Yeah, it's but nothing. but it do you mean in terms of options? How many of, of those 20 people will represent different options or the yes, same choices the, that the elite allows you to have? Yes, because... To go back to your original point. You, because today when you select a political party, the political party decides that some Vaknin will be prime minister. But if you vote directly, you will have three options. 
five options, 90 options. I don't know how many are qualified. And you will decide who will be prime minister. Not but I mean, that's, the, not. that's the same thing with uh, uh, um, elections now. Like when you go to the ballot now in Macedonia, you have 50 options. Yet all uh, uh, voting is concentrated in two or three or five. So, so, decides, so the presence of, of, of options minister. doesn't necessarily translate to who actual who will be prime minister. Again, it doesn't matter if you make use of the options. It matters that you have the options. If you make an individual choice not to use the options, okay, many people don't vote. So does it mean we have to cancel voting? You must okay, have but, the but, but if we look at it that way, then I will I would I would say Amazon is not the only option to to get books. Really? Barnes and Noble still them? exists. Uh, Barnes and Noble still exists. I there is there is ten bookstores. Uh, there is uh, not ten, but three bookstores in Bitola, which have no affiliation with Amazon. Yeah, and you can get there four million books. You can't get four million books, but you can buy and you basically can get, the and books you that you're most likely to be looking for based on the appearance of choice, but not having you, options. You, you can find ninety percent. Ninety percent of the books of, yeah, on Amazon are not available in Barnes and Noble. I know because I work with both. They're not okay, available. Okay, but then your My point book is, is that, not available because Barnes and Noble went went essentially bankrupt. I see, but 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 that is that is then that your is is then your point that options represents that if there's five complete copies of Amazons, but they're not called Amazon? Option represents your ability to not buy an Amazon. So, but there is that option right now. No, there and, isn't. And your retort you is you can't book, buy you everything buy. No, that you can buy isn't. on. There isn't. It, that, yeah, but, but, but your retort is you can't buy everything you can buy on Amazon in another place. And that's true. But then what you're uh, arguing for so is four identical clones of Amazon. So, so that you can... They are limited. If you can't buy my book, Anywhere except on Amazon, your options, by definition, are limited. No, but if your book is a basically an international bestseller, you will be able to buy it in my any bookstore in Bitola. Be, my book happens to be international bestseller. I, I, you know what I mean? Like if it's something... No, very, I don't know what people, you mean. Most international okay, bestsellers... I mean, I mean if, if it's something that people often look for when they enter, for example, brick and mortar stores... That is not definition stores. of options. Options is when you are looking for what you need, not what for other what other people want. So, so in, in in your basically definition, an option is only something that can support that can support everything a different option can support, not a subset. An option of is that if you want something, you are not limited to a single provider, single politician, single political party, single uh, okay. store, single retail outlet. I, Today, I, I would argue. I would argue that's the case even right now. There are limited, but I mean, I, I would say. Amazon is, okay, really, Amazon is I, not I, even I, an option in Macedonia. To you because I don't know. Sometimes you say nonsense. That do, is do you know? Do you know, for example, that a, a good percentage of the books? Uh, Peter, I prefer if you move on to the next question. Really, you, sometimes you say things that I. Who is this guy? I mean, what the fuck? Where did you come from? I'm, You're talking nonsense. We are different. We are different people. We have different understandings. It's we are not talking different. You are, because you are we are talking hoping. Nonsense. We are hoping. Sorry, we are hoping nonsense. to understand each other. Okay, Peter. If you continue, I will have to say goodbye. I don't deal with people who talk nonsense, not based on reality. Can I, I'm sorry, can I, can you're I, trying I, to show that you're clever, okay. you're smart, you're intelligent. Got it. You're intelligent. Move on. Based what on I'm trying, I, what I'm trying to find, what I'm, I'm trying to get clarity from your for your position. That's what I'm to trying get to get clarity. Do. You're trying to show that you're clever. Got it. You're clever. Move on. Move on. Okay. Can I intervene, please? Uh, I would say this, that the uh, monopole or oligopole uh, is present in all major industries. Currently in the United States, the army industry, the uh, war machine, it's about 600, 700 billion, I believe. You know, Sam, what bigger than the army? is the sick industry, I call it, is the health industry. So basically, once they get you sick, or let's say uh, you have problem with your blood in the sugar, you know, insulin, this and that, you're a lifelong customer. You know how much they're worth? Over 4 billion. I mean, it's a 600 billion. These are 4 trillion, I'm sorry. 4 trillion versus 600 billion, the army. So the health industry, the monopoly, or what would you call them, oligopoly, couple of them, uh, COVID vaccines and all of them, they have a monopoly, just like in the political uh, illusion of choice. The same thing is in the in the health or sick industry, I call it. Uh, the same is in the army industry. You got to have uh, 
NATO standard, uh, by NATO standard uh, equipment for your army. So it's a monopoly on a global scale in, in most of mainstream media. Uh, just, just mention one word, all of them pretty much are in the hands of the 1%. And uh, like Sam said, we are uh, slaves who have a partial uh, freedom of uh, illusion of the choice. That's what I would uh, prize this whole thing. If um, you like to add something, please do so. There, are, there's a concept of uh, media desert, media desert in the United States, for example. These are huge parts of the country. Uh, today, about eighty percent of the United States that either have a single newspaper, or in majority of cases, no newspaper or any other medium, not only newspaper, and no media of any kind that's close to 80% of the territory. So if you live in these villages and towns and small cities and so on and so forth, you're utterly dependent on media providers that are essentially national. And there are very few of them, of course. And you don't have a local paper, for example, who is investigating the corruption of the mayor. The mayor is corrupt, the police is corrupt. And, and used to be in the 50s and 60s and so on, there used to be a local newspaper, and usually two or three even, and they would compete to expose corruption and so on. Today, in majority of the United States, you have a media desert. In other words, there's nobody there. But, and so they are highly... They moved online, basically. No, uh, they vanished. They disappeared. Uh, online, online is... They tried the model of online behind paywall, so that you, you put your content as a paywall, you have to pay, and, but it didn't work. Even for Encyclopedia Britannica, New York Times, paywall is, is a huge problem. Washington Post, paywall has become a, a big problem. It's not fully, not fully operational model. And so there is an impoverishment, an impoverishment of our options, which this is why I call it slavery, because yes, you can do anything you want. You can buy books, you can buy you know, pork chops, you can travel, you can drive a car, you can, I mean, you can, anything you want, you can do. And your relative material condition, as Petag has said, has improved, of course. But you are more and more, and every year more, every year more dependent on a tiny group of providers, all of them owned by a tiny group of people. And that sounds a lot like slavery. To me, slaves have agency. Even slaves in the South, they had agency. They could do this, they could sing, they could dance, they could, you know. But ultimately, it's the question if, is, can you exit the system? That's the key. Can you exit the system? What is the answer to that? Can you exit the system now? You can't really exit the system. Because, Why not? Because of, glo because of globalization and so on. But... Not, not only because globalization itself is, is not the major problem. The major problem is international brands are, have been weaponized. Uh, it's well known, for example, that when Walmart comes into a new area, all the small grocery shops close down. They're dead. Yeah. Same yeah. with Amazon. When I started to work with Barnes & Noble, Barnes & Noble had 2,400 2, branches. All over the United States. It was uh, bricks, a mix. Brick and mortar. Huh? Brick and mortar stores? Yes. Hmm. All over the United States. It was an institution. Pe people were going there not only to buy books, but to socialize, to, you know. And then Amazon came. And Amazon didn't only go online. So you could say, okay, there's Barnes and Noble brick and mortar, and Amazon is online. Amazon initially established brick and mortar stores. Yeah, that, that was a few years ago. Yeah. Just to destroy Barnes & Noble, and the minute Barnes & Noble closed, they closed. The only purpose of the brick and mortar of Amazon was to destroy. So today, Barnes & Noble is down to, if my memory doesn't fail me, here you can check me up, but I think down to 400 branches, or maybe 200, I'm not sure. They lost 2,000. So this is what I mean. And when I started to sell books, I'm, I'm talking about my book, because my book used to be, now it's not, but used to be a, a giant bestseller. Uh, international vessel. And so when I started, you could buy it in at least nine locations, at least. 
Today, I have no choice. I must sell it in, in Amazon. I must sell it in Amazon. And Amazon, by the way, are very, if you sell it elsewhere, they take your book off. They don't let you, like in perfect competition, in perfect competition, I can sell it here and there. Amazon says to you, if you sell it anywhere else, forget about it. You can't sell it with us. And they're so behaving they, like a monopoly, basically. Yeah. They're monopoly. They're not like they're monopoly. Absolute monopoly. Same with the Google Play. If you place an app on Google Play, they put such conditions that take the app outside of other marketplaces, which is why Google now is in court with antitrust. There's an antitrust lawsuit against Google for this. Same with YouTube. YouTube doesn't tell you what to do. Doesn't If you want to take your video, put it in Rumble, you know, similar, BitChoot, BitChoot or whatever. No problem with that. There's no problem with that. But Google imposes implicit conditions that are such, for example, censorship of speech that make it homogenous, make it monopoly, make it... So this is called monoculture. You, why did you, a few months ago, there was a, a bug, there was malware in a, in a provider, in a service provider of Microsoft, not Microsoft itself, but a service provider, security provider. And there was a bug, there was a malware, and there, thousands of systems around the world collapsed, and they, there was a big mess, and there were losses of billions and so on. You're talking why, about Cloudflare. Yes. Why did this happen? Because it's a monoculture. Because Microsoft controls well over 90% of all the screens in the world. It's not only a question of choice, of options, of slavery. I mean, these, are, these are philosophical debates. We can agree, disagree. It's dangerous. It's simply dangerous. Because if tomorrow there will be a super hacker, a genius, who would find a way to utterly destroy Windows systems everywhere, what will happen to the world? And, and so we are, we are increasingly becoming concentrated in the, hand of, in the hands of probably 10 individuals. We are talking 10 individuals, Bezos, uh, Musk, 10. No, we're not talking. But, but do you think that's a recent development? And do, do you think this is continuing to, to uh, develop in that direction? Because, I mean, you mentioned Rumble. Rumble became a provider of basic uh, video services as a response, I mean, Rumble it used to exist as a provider of just commercial videos, but they were not kind of being a YouTube um, competition. They have yes. grown into a YouTube competition as a response to what you're talking about. Yes. Uh, uh, Rumble grew, became an alternative to YouTube because of the limitations of free speech, essentially. So, so wouldn't you say that, that explains... But look at that the numbers. That... But look at the numbers. Who cares that there is... Look at the numbers. It's meaningless. Rumble is meaningless. If it were to vanish tomorrow, nothing would happen. It's meaningless. So There's a much, there was a much bigger rival to YouTube, much bigger than Rumble, Vimeo. Vimeo was much bigger. And YouTube destroyed Vimeo. Destroyed it in a variety of ways. So YouTube doesn't pay attention to Rumble. Rest assured, Rumble will become dominant. Forget about Rumble. Rest assured. I would say not uh, that we just cannot get out of the system under the claw of this system, but we cannot even speak against the system. Depends against which monopoly or which oligarch you're speaking against. That's what kind of consequences you're going to bear. Look at Assange. He spoke against the military industrial warmongers complex. That's what happened to him. They have a, a big claw. They can touch anywhere. So the bigger they are, the scarier the consequences. So far away from uh, getting out of the system, even farther from freedom of speech. Uh, YouTube doesn't have a freedom of speech. So like Sam said, Rumble has freedom of speech, but it's too small to compare to YouTube. And the monopoly has YouTube, the monopoly is in Google, the monopoly is in the uh, warmongers, in the health industry, wherever you look, it is a single person or, or organization that has the claw over the uh, the population in, in general. Peter, you know, you know why YouTube... Uh, yes, I agree with Gotze. He summarized perfectly what I've been saying all this. But you know why YouTube and TikTok have become monopolies? Because of influencers. 
today about 72 or 73% of the traffic on TikTok is influencers selling mm-hmm. consumer goods. And I don't know the percentage on YouTube, but it's not small. And of course, advertising on YouTube. So I mean, YouTube, I mean, they're, they're at the top for sure. <laughs> so. Yes, YouTube and TikTok are extensions of the consumer ideology. They're not educational platforms. They're not free speech platforms. It's bullshit. This is the brainwashing. The actuality, they're an advertising platform, which happens to have content. Happens to have content by mistake. Mm. But it, it's, it's again about, uh, and who is advertising? An analysis published recently demonstrated that of 10 advertisers control 70% of the advertisements on YouTube, and these 10 advertisers happen to be the biggest conglomerates in the United States, which happen to be owned by these famous four, five oligarchs or five tycoons, or whatever you want to call them. Whichever way you look, these are loops interfeeding other loops. These are all feedback mechanisms, self-enhancing, enhancing each other. It's There's no way out. There's no way out. It's uh, This is the, the sense of slavery. Not, I agree with you, we are not slaves in the sense that we do things uh, under threat. Or, but the threat is that you will be excommunicated, that you will be taken out of the system. That this is the threat. And the threat is Damocles' sword, you know? It's mm. floating above you. If you misbehave, they will silence you. If you misbehave even more, you will end up in prison. If you, if you misbehave... They will ban you, block you, take you out of the system, and there's no life outside the system. There's no. I, I would say I would say that was worse, maybe two, three, five years ago. Uh, I follow a lot of dissident, uh, yeah. for example, people that have alternative media and stuff. Previously, when they were blocked on YouTube, it was impossible to find them anywhere. But since the advent of Rumble, since the advent of you know, uh, uh, since uh, especially Musk bought Twitter, uh, right now a, bl- a ban on YouTube is not a death sentence. Not and a death for- sentence, but a, sus- a coma sentence. Yeah, yeah. So is, it's, it's, yeah. What is Rumble? I mean, what is Rumble? Rumble I mean, is I mean they, they, have, they have the highest um, uh, live stream, I think. Dan Bongino is like the highest live stream numbers. We're talking about concurrent peop- uh, users on the stream watching live well you have you have options like telegram telegram uh, also yes uh, they, they, they have basically they support streaming since, yeah. since the pandemic since the pandemic people have learned that they're slaves i agree with it there's been a great awakening that's exactly proves what i'm saying actually that people left youtube and went to rumble and telegram that proves what i'm saying that mm. why did they leave youtube if they were not slaves they left YouTube because they woke up to their situation and their condition. Mm. They, they woke up to this brainwashing and control of the masses. And the, and the masses said, we need an alternative. We need options. And the masses started to construct options. But will, it, will this survive for long? I doubt it. The, the elites will strike back. Mm. They, I have no doubt about this. Because the masses are becoming dangerous. The masses are really empowered with technology and so on, and democracy. So they will take away democracy, the elites, you will see. They will take away democracy, and they will take away technology. Suddenly there will be regulations, there will be all kinds of things, and you will find that your ability to operate with technology freely is more and more and more and more and more limited, to the point that you are criminalized if you do certain things. I I would say that... I would agree with that up to the COVID pandemic. And I think during the COVID pandemic, the kind of the shadow um, elite that you're talking about, I think overplayed their hand. And I think they were, they kind of facilitated the awakening that you're talking about. And I think, uh, I believe in the ingenuity of the human civilization. And that's where you have stuff like crypto, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically ways to, to, as you said, disconnect from the system. system. Yeah, yeah, disconnect from the system. And that's one of the things that we are kind of advertising on this podcast for in, inside Macedonia to disengage from the from the narrative of the system, of the state, so that you can 
kind of reclaim some of the sovereignty that has been taken from you uh, by the state. Um, I will finish by I'll finish by mentioning something that uh, that I think is under mentioned. Uh, academic publishing, books, copyrighted books. Today you have shadow libraries, like Library Genesis, Z Library, and so on, where you can get any book ever published. Anna Freud, uh, uh, Freud uh, Anna Archive, I'm sorry, Anna Archive has most of the books ever published. So for free, you have the biggest library available, and of 100 million, 107 million published academic papers in history, you have 83 million available through these platforms. In academic publishing and in publishing generally, the masses won the battle. There they won the battle. So maybe you're right. Maybe that's a precedent. Mm. And it will happen in other fields. I hope so. I hope so, because the alternative is tight control by a group of tycoons, many of whom are mentally ill. Now I'm speaking as a psychologist. <laughs> mentally ill tycoons. And these people will impose on us monoculture. And we know from medicine that when you don't, when you have homogeneity, in monoculture, you are susceptible to viruses and bacteria. You you die. The mm. body the body will die if we don't free ourselves of this. Awesome. I, I do believe in the ingenuity of uh, humankind. We we will find the solution for this as well. We found solution for everything, <laughs> including even that for initial this, even for this dialogue. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right, All right guys. So, uh, let me say this uh, last. If you guys found this uh, uh, video interesting and educational, hopefully you have the links that Sam provided for you to upgrade yourself, update. Uh, if that wasn't enough, I invite everyone to come on Saturday, so October 26th, 6 p.m. in Ohrit in Kasarna Hub. Uh, Professor Sam will be uh, holding a lecture in um, uh, the narcissistic uh, abuse uh, title into the dark side and back you're all welcome to come uh it's a free entry so i hope to see you all guys over there at 6 p.m saturday Thank i you. hope to see both of you peter peter and uh, Gotze. i hope to see you in Opit. it's not that far from Bitola, yeah. yeah yes yes Skopje is far but Tohrit not so much <laughs> okay not so much so you got, right, the, good, thank you. You got the good bargain yeah. yeah thank you very much for um thank you for having um, me for your um, answers and for the, the interesting discussion i hope you had a, a good time and yeah, I, hope, I hope you will come back when we invite you next time of and, course uh, yeah everyone else have a